I'll pay respects to uh, Long Paul's by making three bows. First bow, please. Second bow. Over to you, Long So, <clears throat> welcome to the stream, Dharma stream session today. And as you notice, I'm not in my normal studio, which is my kuti in England. I'm currently uh, staying in Ireland. This is just some, a little room I'm in. I haven't had the occasion to set up a proper um, recording situation. So I don't have a shrine here at the moment. So this is a bit bare. But um, there we are. Um, this is where I am. And this is where you are. So today is going to be a questions and answers session. And we'll begin, perhaps, I want to you give as much time as possible for that. We'll begin just with a few minutes of meditation, <clears throat> cultivation. <clears throat> <clears throat> And we're going to center in um, quality of heart called meaning. And we associate the heart sense with emotions or moods, but it's also the place of meaning. Things affect you, things touch you, things excite you, things um, gladden you. And uh, so this is very important. This is chitta. And uh, <clears throat> this is a place where we, in order to really enter citta, and in fact, it's very helpful to cultivate this in order to enter citta, to just move away from the realm of discriminating thoughts and circumstances. We ask ourselves, what's really important for me? And what's, uh, what are my values? What's really important for me? And give yourself some time. Don't just rush into it. But where did you where do you find yourself really feeling solid or lit up or gladdened? Qualities such as um, generosity, kindness, uh, honesty, integrity, perhaps. And use 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 the words sparingly. So you just get that word, whatever it is courage, integrity, something like that, and you listen to the word, and how does that, what impression does that leave in your heart? Just the quality itself, what does it mean to you? Mm. What's the feeling of that? Of course, at any time of day, we can find a number of things touch us, which excite us or annoy us, you know, circumstantial. This is a very quick flash. We get a flash of attraction. We get a flash of irritation. We get a flash of negativity or, or depression. It's a very flashing experience, superficial. And if you linger on it, of course, it becomes deeply embedded. Now, real values perhaps take a little more effort to establish the feeling of them. So they're not just words. They're not just I should be, or I'm supposed to be, but actually what really is going to last longest through all the world of circumstances, through the fortunes and misfortunes, separation, sickness, ups and downs, what's really going to last and stay with me? Mm, important to know, wouldn't you think? Not just as an idea, but as a sense of something where I, I feel I'm sitting a bit stronger. I feel a bit more complete, steady. What matters? Something matters a lot. It's important you know what it is.
you get a sense something rings your bell, something lights you up. That's called energy, that lighting up, that resonance, that's heart energy. Right. Gladness, pamoja, it's a heart energy. Now, when you get into that, as you sense any of that, that rising, that sense of something becomes strong for you in your heart. Now as you're breathing, without shifting your focus, just widening your focus to include how you breathe when you're in your place of value. I say this because if you cultivate it, maybe this is nothing new for you, maybe this is something rather new for you. If you cultivate it, the quality of your value will affect your breathing. You become steadier, more settled. Also, that quality, see if you're breathing, which is a body energy, begins to gradually bring that heart quality into a larger and deeper experience. It's an embodied quality. See if your integrity or your honesty or your harmlessness saturates your body or your sense of presence. When I mean body, I don't mean your ears or your teeth, and your sense of being here becomes saturated with that value. You become strong in it, grounded in it. body energy supports the heart energy. together this is a foundation for what's called samadhi it the power of discriminating thought diminishes becomes subsidiary not dominant and the concerns of the thinking mind become secondary or fade out Present day circumstances seem just like old brown photographs that really are not essential. What is essential carries you through all this changing tide. It's your refuge.
It can refresh you when you're feeling tired. It can compose you when you're feeling fragmented and jittery. It can make you economous when you're feeling confronted by difficulty. It's a strength and a beauty to it. You're feeling for this, this place. It's not self. You don't need to construct an identity. It is itself. It doesn't need a name, a gender, an occupation, or an age. All these we disband as secondary or sometimes even irrelevant. In this place of true heart, you'll notice also that so many of your, of the circumstances that haunt us, you experience them as this is regret, this is doubt, this is irritation. And so it's very direct. It doesn't have the story to it, it just takes you straight to the particular distress that's happening in the heart now. Not people, not the future, no others, but the sense of lack, insecurity, uh, frustration, or whatever. And that's what you bring your heart to bear upon. Mm -hmm. Breathing through the discords.
Okay, I'm going to move into a different mode now. And we may get back to that meditation, something you can extend for as long as you like, actually, because it should be a constant returning every day. This is why we take refuges and precepts every day. It's really about resetting our life in accordance with this. But I'd like to make sure we have enough time to address some of the questions you posted on Dharma tracks. And to say, first of all, that um, this is Dharma Stream, and this has been set up uh, by a disciple, a supporter in Singapore. So we can use this soon, bro. And we are grateful and acknowledge that. I didn't set this up. Uh, it's not mine. I, I, I'm happy to contribute to it. Similarly with Dharma Tracks, I didn't set that up. Um, it's not mine. It's um, another uh, supporter, disciple, asked if this is possible, would like to do it, so that for other people's welfare, and set it up. And with my permission, check things out and makes an effort to make that happen, often with other, a few other people's support. It's not run by an institution, it's not run by the monastery. I don't have... You don't even really have that much direct access to it. Um, so, but what I, I can't even really answer your questions on that, on that form that you can see on Dharma Tracks. I read them and from time to time I'd like to scoop up a few of these questions and respond to them. I'm not in a position to be able to offer one-to-one -one, um, teachings uh, to, uh, there are many of you and there are not that many hours in a day. Um, um, so this is what I can do through these, through these forms that have been set up. And what you see in front of you, this is not mine either. This is something created by a man and a woman who have both passed away now. <laughs> we lived in England, they created this thing. That's not really mine, it's been supported primarily by arms food for the last 46 years. So it's a, it's a group effort that keeps this thing going. And uh, uh, so I can use it. And in fact, um, I have used it. It's bearing, bearing some of the marks of aging and general things that one does in one's life. Uh, much of this mind is not mine either. That's also a, a corporate, um, corporate territory. Fortunately, the Buddha Dhamma has occupied a considerable amount of it. So that's what I'll try to be teaching from or presenting from. This example really of um, really understanding what we take as a self or an entity is, is not an entity or a self at all. Everything, everything arises through factors coming together, separate factors unifying, coming together, cooperating, co-mingling, co-rising. <clears throat> but within this experience, we generally, the thinking mind experiences myself, fixed thing, others, self, other. It cuts things up into discrete objects. This is what's fundamental activity. This is me, that's that, I'm here, that's there. This is now, I will be in the future. It does this. It's a discriminating system that operates um, in accordance with where discrimination is necessary. Um, this is my shoes, this is my house, and so forth. But it also operates where it's not really necessary. In fact, it's pretty harmful. In this sense, it creates an identity called me who sits somewhere and I can never really find it, but it continually bothers my heart. It splits off and it talks to me, talks to my heart a lot. And it says, you are this, you are not this, you could be this and you should be that. And uh, it creates a separate object other than what you're actually experiencing. And it also tries to resolve itself by generally by some kind of act of editing or correcting or even punishing. 
none of which do much good because it's a fiction. <clears throat> Based upon that, I'm going to that initial <laughs> presentation. I'm going to look at a few questions, really coming from that some of that paradigm of the separate self and self and other, and to what extent this measurement self and other is useful, and to what extent it's it's um, useless and in fact destructive. So first question, how to work with jealousy at others' good fortune, especially when they praise themselves. When I bring to mind the image of a friend who is happy with aspects of their life, I suggest that behind some superficial rejoicing in them, I feel a sense of jealousy. It is a sense of lack in my life. And that's in the way. When I look at this feeling of lack, it feels quite vague and unformed, more like a habit from childhood. This was a skillful way of working with it. Well, I think you've got it pretty much right there. Um, you know, this uh, sense of others, this is a sense of others when it's coming from an unskillful place, based on an unskillful mindset. I am different from others. As the baseline, that becomes the fundamental uh, foundation. I am different, she is different. Now, we can say to an external extent that's true, but it's not the most basic fundamental quality. If we look at very fundamentally, we go into what we experience ourselves as being most fundamentally, and we keep going through physical shape, yeah, 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 da, 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 and you come into a sense of presence and being affected, being sensitive. It's presence, awareness, and being affected by experience. That's where that's what your chitta is. And that doesn't really do uh, an identity. It doesn't really do self and others. It does feeling, feeling disappointed, feeling gladdened, uh, aroused, re re uh, friction, conflict, discord. It does that. It has these resonances move through it. And this is on account of these resonances or distortions occur because of something else, a fundamental sense of something's missing in here. Something's not quite complete in here. This sense, missing, lack, not enough, not good enough, need more, something wrong. This is called ignorance. It's a sense of something's not quite here. Yeah, we don't, something we haven't got. Now, awija, something we don't sense. There's something here that's not enough, right? That's an absence, right? There's an absence in the core of my heart. It's an absence in my life that I'm trying to fill up that absence. Yeah. <clears throat> so when that absence occurs, that sense of not enough, I throw some food in it. That doesn't quite do it. I maybe get a motorbike, throw a motorbike in it. That doesn't do it. I take it out dancing. That doesn't really do it. It kind of it takes me away from that sense of absence, but it doesn't really fill it. I keep throwing all these things in it, and it doesn't quite fill it up. We put people in there to fill me up. <laughs> it still doesn't do it. Yeah. This hole never seems to get full up. Well, the problem is it's not a hole. That's why you can't fill it. <laughs> it's a block. It's not a hole, it's a block. It's a block, a lump of something called not knowing, not sensing. And what is not sensed is the true domain and the stability and the beauty of heart. So because of this not knowing or not sensing, not feeling, the sense of not enough, not enough happens. So that becomes 
a kind of a baseline or a fundamental position on a very very basic level and everybody has this kind of thing happening for them yeah and then so is that not enough not enough and it's as that like a kind of an underground turbulence an underground dis-ease now as our discriminating mind which is tuned to that's that that's this that's here that's there this is black this is white that's her that's me feels this sense of not enough because oh oh that if i had that if i had that i don't have that i'm not this so it starts to transmit that sense of inadequacy or incompleteness to what it sees around it oh if i had one of those i'd be no, i'd be happy oh why can't i have that one for some why can't i get that one and of, of course the most <laughs> so this, yeah, you see, this very set sense desire occurs. But even more profoundly than sense desire, we are fundamentally um, social creatures. Yeah, you know, we came, we grew up, we originated in somebody else's body. We were framed and born, mother, father. Uh, we were brought up in schools, families, education. We went to workplaces, shared towns, cities, villages. We are saturated in the sense of belonging to other people. Now, when that sense of lack arises as a thing, then it's always comparing. I'm this, I'm the, I'm the not enough. So she's got it better. I'm not enough. She's got, I've got this sense of not enough. And that sense of not enough, I look around and think, he's got more than I have. More people like her than me. I don't get what she does. You know, she's having happiness, I'm not. So that sense of lack looks around and it sees things to confirm it. Now, clearly, you could look at these bodies and say, well, this her body is smaller or taller, or the shape, I like that shape better than I like this shape. Or, you know, he has a lot of wealth i don't have a lot of wealth yeah or um you know whatever yeah. uh, and so so you the, that what's happening is that that mind is focusing on the qualities that will support the sense of lack yeah and this is very I mean, then we get craving i want to have i want to why can't i get why can't i get and then one of the negative forms is jealousy. How come she gets so much and I don't? How come he had such a good time and I didn't? Yeah. Jealousy occurs. And we think, oh dear, I shouldn't be jealous. Because then that discrimination turns back and oh, I, we see ourselves as an object. A discriminating, make, discriminating mind creates myself as an object that I think about. And, well, myself is not good enough. Well, what's happening is the sense of lack is now turning its attention to the image of self that it creates. Get that? It creates a sense of a separate self when in fact we can't really find a separate self. It creates one. That's its first action. And then the sense of ignorance or lack looks at that sense of self and says, that's not enough. Because nothing's enough. When you're in the place of ignorance, nothing is good enough. <laughs> Apart from what you don't have. That's why ignorance supports craving. Right? Avijja tanha, ignorance supports craving. So nothing is ever good enough apart from that which I want. So when I come to looking at this idea of myself, which is produced through ignorance, this is not good enough either. Then we say, well, if I was wiser, brighter, stronger, more vigorous, more fluent, da, 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 then I would be good. <laughs> right? So then you get... But you're not. So then you get the negativity starts occurring. 
in that the criticism starts occurring. Because mm -hmm. we're in the grip of ignorance and craving, and it's all being broadcast by the discriminating mind mm -hmm. that sees things as separate. Now, discriminating mind, do you get that? This discriminating mind that sees things as separate is a function that we have. It's a useful function in many ways. It can, you know, it, it gives us orientation on a sensory level. It is also highly developed in human beings because now we can also imagine things like the future. And we can organize that, even though it doesn't exist. We can remember things in the past, even though it's past, and we can organize that. We can stack up our memories that prove this or that. I'm like this because of this, that, and the other. All actions are discriminating mind. Many of those actions are based upon the sense of lack. So in the future, I will be if I get this and that and the other. If I organize this and that, I will have a nice, clear, steady, smooth journey until the airplane is cancelled or the train crashes or the you know, 101 things happen that don't work out according to the plans. And yet we still keep the, acting that way. And throws it out. So instead, with meditation, it will just woo. Now, when you try to meditate from the discriminating mind, you're in difficulty because it isn't really meditation, it's thinking. That's why you establish refuges and precepts first so you really enter the domain of heart because the domain of heart, its function is embracing rather than discriminating. Yeah. It feels, and when you feel something, you're immediately at that moment. If I am I touched by a touch, at that moment I'm not separate from it because it's touching me, right? If I am moved with joy or even anger, then at that moment I'm not separate from that which made me that way. It, it kind of embraces the feeling. Yeah. So it's a different organ altogether. Now, now, of course, this heart quality can also be very negatively affected. And so we say, let's just get the heart in the right place because it's often got distortions. It's under the power of ignorance. It gets affected. It gets confused and frightened. It gets bonded to these effects. So let's put it in a place where it's really bonding to and taking as its baseline, good heart, the baseline. Yeah. Now, remember, it isn't something you exactly create, but you stimulate it. You drop in perceptions that remind you of that quality, of value, of value. You take a stand on honesty, generosity, kindness, and you feel them, and you feel them, and you breathe them, and you chant them. So they become much more than just notions and principles, they become felt energies. And from that, when that's strong, all this ignorance stuff, it just, you know, all the objects that have been created of ignorance start to just dissolve or disappear or become abated. So you can look at them with insight saying, oh, that's where the problem is. That's where it is. So now you've got a vantage point on that. And so we see another person. We don't think she's better than me. You start to think, oh, she's just like me. She also has the body, feelings, heart. She also has sorrow and joy. She also gets happy. She probably gets unhappy. She probably also feels she's better than somebody and worse than somebody else. She probably also has the same disease as I have, 
which is feeling a sense of lack and she's trying to fill it up. So there she is, dressing up, looking good, chatting and laughing, smiling and joking, trying to put on something to make herself, herself feel good because at the bottom of it, she has the same sense of lack as I have. And all this stuff is just helping to compensate for that. Then you have a feeling of compassion. It really helps. It's a very powerful value, compassion. There's no judgment in it. You know, and all the confusions and the happiness and the playfulness and whatever it is that we see in others in. Just like me. Yeah, I know that too. And there's some sense of you step back. Other people show you that what you take as yourself is not, it's just the same material. And you look at it with a sense of, mm, don't identify with this. Don't get intense about this. Don't get possessive about this. Don't get disgusted by this. It's just stuff. And essentially, this, these, are, these give us a sense of what comes from the heart, samasankapa, right motivation, right resolve, right intent, you might say, the intent of sustaining harmlessness, non-brutality, this intent of sustaining non-callousness, empathy, intent to not hoard and covet, but to do the opposite, to relinquish and let go. Then the heart is beginning to express its strength, express its strength. This is the foundation from which we cultivate right effort to make that resolve realized. So we have an, <laughs> uh, there's just another question, which is, I think it's probably much the same, just to mention it. Uh, uh, living through old age, sickness and death is really highlighting my dread of being a naughty girl, being demanding, unreasonable, unattractive, not putting others first, all the things we have to train ourselves in to fit in with others, especially family. Yeah, well, there it is. Self and others in an unskillful way to fit in with family. Mm. to fit in with workplace, to fit in with colleagues, fit in with the social standards of what a good person is supposed to be. And it's all discriminated stuff from a heart that hasn't found its own strength, its own values. <clears throat> of course, we get indoctrinated into this, this sense of the separate self. Social creatures. It's a human problem. I mean, the other creatures, they say elephants and many other animals are very social creatures. They have anger, they have fear, they have joy. They look after their young, they fight. One thing they don't do, there's no sign of ever doing, is hating themselves. Because their, their sense of social bond is fundamentally empathic we're together, we don't compete, we're looking after each other, that's, that's the bond. And wherever you are in that relationship, you're, you know, you're supported and encouraged and you know, not but rather than something that's aversive. This is something to cultivate towards yourself, your flaws, your blemishes, the things you find disagreeable. You really got to come from the heart with that. You can't start 
sorting other people out, they are, <laughs> they're beyond your reach. However, someone also asking a question to use the grief after loss of a loved one. This person lost the husband to a terminal illness, which affected the health for the last four years of his life. They were practicing Dhamma together for the last 15 years of a 25 year married life. The person's questioner tried her best to help the husband and right until his deathbed. This brings me joy. Helping him helped me as well as he had a very steady mind, even with his brain had dementia. Even now I try to bring his way of thinking to my life when thing goes towards making more suffering. This is using self and other in a skillful way, right? To bring around what this person is talking about, compassion, empathy, sharing, rather than, you know, loss. Now, you know, so again, that sense of bereavement, loss. Um, we are social creatures. So there's what we might call an emotional body. We also have a flesh body, an energy body, we also have an emotional body. An emotional body has its own kind of food and its own processes. And when it receives a shock, just like you've eaten something distasteful, it has to expel it. Grief is one way of expelling the sense of that ripping sense of bereavement. It's, it's the emotional body is regaining its health. Um, it's like, you know, the sense of discord that arises when you've been bonded to someone, the discord that arises, separation. It's emotionally healthy to feel some, some sort of grief. As long as that pertains, the sense of self and other pertains. Now, you might say the, the Arahant doesn't really have a sense of self and other. Um, so there's nothing really gained or lost, they're just conditions and forms arising and passing. I expect most of us are not really at that stage yet. So we're still working with, okay, there's, I, you know, even I get the sense, even, you know, I have so many friends all over the world and I've been locked down. I don't say grief, but a feeling of, oh, I miss seeing so-and-so. It was nice when I was there. Wonder how is he's getting on. Wonder how she's doing. Well, you know, that sense of, oh, people you kind of like to, you like you're concerned for. And so there's a sense of just wishing them well and may they be well and may I be well and just trying to bring forth this quality, this heart quality of kindness and compassion. And that's when we use the sense of self skillfully, the sense of separation skillfully to bring around a quality that unifies us, which is this, which is the Brahma Vihara. And Aging, sickness, and death are great places to trigger and bring around those beautiful fruitions. Gratitude. And then the loved one stays with you. The body disappears, but the loved one stays with you. And you commemorate them and you reflect upon them and you express gratitude. And you also ask forgiveness for things that have gone wrong then you make use of the skillful use of the sense of self and other. Okay, a few more questions. Some couple of questions around, someone experienced a loss of sense of direction. Lot has no mood or zest for living. This is a symptom of depression. Although I'm trying to cultivate calming, the sense of insecurity really overwhelms me. Mm. The sense of loss of direction. 
feeling overwhelmed, um, depressed, and so on. Um, another person, <laughs> so you're certainly not alone, I assure you. Another person experiences the daily suffering. Um, I just thoughts, angry thoughts, distasteful ego, at least self admonishment, and so forth. <clears throat> How to, and it's so, so compulsive, so compelling to linger in these negative, afflictive states. Well, sense of direction, we'll pick up that one. Direction has to be to get centered. And you know, you can't get centered in phenomena that arise and pass. Um, even though they maybe don't pass quick enough. <laughs> but phenomena that arise in security, anxiety, depression, self-aversion. And so that when your attention goes to those forms, if your attention lingers on those forms, if your mind lingers on those forms of anxiety, depression, insecurity, uh, self-criticism, an emotional an intensity, an emotional intensity accumulates. What your attention lingers on, an emotional intensity occurs around that. It really grips you and you get buried in it. It's the emotional intensity that is Led, so the, the attention generates a kind of an emotional intensity around these phenomena and then it becomes you. The sense of you is really an emotional intensity. When you say something's mine, you have a certain emotional intensity around that possession, person, phenomenon, condition, state. You, this is mine. There's an intensity there. <laughs> we really want to get centered in it, getting a little more emotional intensity around qualities such as meaning, value, virtue, generosity, honesty, yeah? faith. And this turning towards the heart is the turning of faith. It doesn't mean a belief, it means turn away from things that are temporal, circumstantial, discordant, turn towards where there's a possibility for beauty, strength, and it's, it's not going to come with a discriminating mind. You have to use, like what I've been mentioning, use, certainly use a thought to touch the heart, what really matters now, centered now, not direction in the future, but direction now is to get to the center of your life. Yeah. And if you find in the center of your life, you just feel really bad, you haven't gone deep enough. If you feel really bad, flawed, imperfect, what's really important here is kindness. You've set the baseline on positive qualities not on negative qualities, not on the sense of self, but on the values of the good heart. And then you can review these distressing phenomena in true light. And the beauty of turning on the light of the heart is rather like when you turn on the light, the shadows disappear by themselves. You don't have to fight with them. They sh the shadows disappear. What am I talking about? Who's that? It's just shadows playing. Very powerful. I agree. Very disturbing. Very gripping. But these are shadows. Turn on the light. Find out where the light switch is. <laughs> know that you have one. That's the turning that we want to bring around for our Dhamma practice. Okay, um, we'd like to just 
spend a little time just dealing with some things perhaps a little more of a theoretical nature. I mean, my, my aim primarily is pragmatic, but some theory perhaps helps to, if you to, you know, um, do your own reflections, see how things line up, get a grip on the teaching. First one is, question is, um, that the person asks that I, me, Ajahn, draws a close parallel between citta, the heart, mind, and chitana, volition. The further question hasn't seen this connection before, I'd be interested to hear more. Well, you know, I think in a way those two words do speak for themselves, citta, chitana, there. Chitana is that which comes from citta. <laughs> You know, you see the very language itself gives you that impression, doesn't it? Chitta, chitana. Um, chitana, no oh, doubt we're dealing with translations. See, so chitta, heart. Well, that heart's just a translation. A simple English word. Uh, intention is, or volition is the word for chitana, and it refers to that jump of impulse. That, ah, that, ooh, that, ah. What's that? That flicker that turns your attention. Chitana. So that comes straight from the heart. It could be, of course, a deluded heart, a confused heart. But, it's, but that jump, Chitana, is pretty instant and very compulsive, com compelling. So we get this kind of rising up of intention. Uh, we follow it, and some of it's not very good, but we follow it, because it's got this power to move the heart. And the heart is the center of our experience. So when that heart moves, the center of our experience moves with it. That's powerful, isn't it? If, if your heart moves with fear, you will see around you all kinds of things that threaten you. Your world moves with you, with your heart. If you, you know, if your heart is intentions, impulses that are to do with um, kindness and sharing, you look around, you think, oh, that's beautiful. I could do that. You know, different set of intentions comes up. Um, so the intention has to be moderated, not just blindly followed, but paused. Check, wait, just a minute before you follow that. Where's that going? Where did it come from? Did it come from a sense of lack and not enough, not good enough? Or does it come from a sense of like to offer something? Transforming the quality of tanha, craving, into the quality of chanda, motivation, purpose. This is how you train chaitanya. And then, okay, you want to sit in your meditation, turn your intention. Where to, where to set the sense of safe, gladness, welcoming, refuge. Establish that intention. I take refuge. This body is taking refuge. It is in refuge. There is safety. It is valuable. It is meaningful. Hmm? Establish the heart. The intention will then follow it. You establish the heart, intention will follow it. If you establish intention, the heart follows that, right? The two go together. So if, if your intention is coming from a confused place, your heart will go to a confused place. Establish it heart first. Intention will come forth in the right way. Follow intention, your heart will follow that. Get it round the right way. It's like before the horse leaves the stable, make sure you're sitting on the back of it. <laughs> Otherwise, it will just run off any old direction. If you're sitting steady, the horse perhaps won't even need to leave the stable. It'll be quite content where it is. Right? Get the priorities right. Chitana, chitta. 
Of course, it takes some intention to even step to even go into the heart. That must be your first one. Act of faith, establish Buddha, take refuge. What is there to take refuge in? Body, not really. Uh, thought, no. Heart, awareness, presence, goodness. Um, mm. First and last question is about unconditioned. Um, some people, some teachers speak of a form of awareness or knowing which is unconditioned. Suttas do not attest to this, but resting, suttas do not attest to this. But resting in awareness naturally leads to letting go inside and dispassion. Well, hmm. Unconditioned is a powerful, somewhat enigmatic term. You might say there are no conditions there. And we probably would recognize a lot of the time conditions are present. Uh, we have certain biases, uh, certain things, uh, desires, uh, uncertainties, uh, fears, uh, compulsions. So we say, well, let's just put the goal of unconditioned is a goal. Let's just put that on the shelf for a while. Start deconditioning the things that uh, uh, cause me suffering. So then we talk about unconditioned as a process of deconditioning. Deconditioning. First of all, the first step is be vaker. Stepping back. Have no position. No aim. Apart from to be aware, step back. This is this, this is that, this is this, this goes this way, this goes that way. Establish sati. This is this, this is that. So that quality has a degree of unconditioned and it's not conditioned by a goal in the future. It's not conditioned by I will be, I want to be. It's, it's only its basic stance is there will be seeing and knowing. So to that extent, that is already really removing some conditioning forces. As that, as that becomes more potent, we'll recognize the quality of passion that's arising in the mind, what I've called emotional intensity. I get really excited about this. I feel really upset about that. This bothers me. This worries me. This makes me feel rattled. And it What's the common denominator of it? They've all got emotional intensity to them that moves me. You know, as I contemplate that, and most of the work of meditation, just contemplating that emotional intensity and not getting intense about it. You know, this is just a thought, this is just a feeling, this is just an mood and emotion. It rises and passes. Where does it go to? Where does it come from? It doesn't go anywhere useful. It arises from somewhere I don't even know. It's kind of just a confused instinct. Does it go anywhere useful? Well, it goes on and on and on. Therefore, one becomes what's called disenchanted. It's just me getting excited. Okay, so what, you know? And <laughs> this has an effect. Somehow this cooling effect, another level of conditioning begins to disappear, which is this sense of emotional intensification or grasping, as it's called. So that's quite a lot of, that's a powerful degree of conditioning that's been released. Another set of, even further than that, is the sense of self. I am practicing, I am this, I am not that, how am I, how was I, am I, this also goes nowhere useful. Can this sense of taking things personally, identifying, can this also be, it's just, what's that? How interested are you in that? How valuable is that? Now, in some walks and attitudes of our life, it's, it's very useful when we're in a social situation, 
But in meditation, you don't need an identity. In fact, it gets in the way. In certain places, you do want an identity. You want a relative identity. You know, I'm, I'm this. This is me. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> me. That's useful. But when you meditate, you don't need it anymore. So it's like clothes, you take them off. And you begin to see this identity thing in this level of experience is just a really a bit of a burden and something grows dispassion. Then you release another lot of conditioning. And then this is where unconditioned becomes much more a uh, valid term. Now, the quality of awareness that's moving through that also increasingly purifies, I would say, as we go along. So I don't personally think we start with unconditioned awareness. I think we start with a good handle on it and we continue to purify that. But that's just my take on it. Um, a couple of other ones at the time. Somebody asked about casinas, which the person, the questioner, uh, the casinas, these are sometimes appear, particularly in, in line with the Visuddhi Magga, which is a famous meditation manual written in about fifth century in Sri Lanka by an eminent bhikkhu called Puddhagosa. It acts as a kind of foundation stone of much of subsequent what's called Theravada. Um, Kasinos was a seemingly good meditation where you look at something, an object, until eventually you can close your eyes and still see that object kind of in your mind's eye. Then you focus on that object in your mind's eye until the mind becomes very purified and another kind of sign arises. You focus on that. It's quite a complex system. Since these signs are called casinas, you look at an object out there, like a disc. It seems they had a disc of some kind, like a white disc or a gold disc, and you keep looking at it steadily until eventually, when you close your eyes, you can still see it. So then you retain that mental impression and you start focusing on that it leads to concentration and this seems to have been very uh, the system they were using perhaps in Sri Lanka or southern India at that time but one has to say that it doesn't really appear in the suttas <clears throat> the word kasina is used in the suttas but very rarely actually uh, and it's not even explained it just says there are an earth kasina or water kasina or fire kasina an air casino, um, um, and a space casino, and a consciousness casino. So what these things actually refer to in the suttas is rather difficult to say. Um, but they don't seem to appear, prom they only appear very rarely, one, you know, about half a dozen times in the entire sutta pitika. So although this casino system could work and seemingly these people made it work, it's not actually um, kind of what the Buddha taught. So I, I don't generally, I have, I, have, I have practice with this, but I don't, I don't, I generally do follow the Buddha or as close as I can get to the Buddha in the, some of the other um, canonical works, like the Pali Canon or even the Chinese canons. Remember, all we have is these texts. And all, um, the most complete text is the Pali canon. But you can't really say it's original because clearly all the, man, the earliest manuscript we have is about 15th century because it was all written on palm leaves, you see, which disintegrate. So we've got nothing really that goes back to the time of the Buddha that we can validate. All the stuff in India got wiped out. You've got some versions in China, some versions in Tibet, some versions in Sri Lanka, and they, some of them really seem to match up to give you a feeling of, yeah, this, this is pretty much, must have been what the Buddha taught. If it's not actually word for word, this is what he taught. So these canons have their uses. Um, but this other thing is a kind of what's called Theravada development, which occurred about eight, 800, 900 years after the Buddha. <clears throat> okay, Hiriotapa, last one. 
Heliotopa. Uh, can you use Heliotopa for those who are not familiar with these words? Heliotopa is a sense of conscience and concern, or sometimes moral fear and dread. Uh, basically, which is pretty grim, isn't it? But it, first of all, it means, Heli means, you know, I feel I've let myself down. That was not beautiful. Yeah. And then, um, you know, my behavior wasn't very, wasn't very beautiful. And Otipa means I think I've let other people down. I've really, you know, made things difficult for them. Mm. And they, they will be diminished by my actions. Mm. So, Hiri and Otipa, and these are called the guardians of the world, because if these are present, then they keep restraining our recklessness. They keep encouraging us to be more sensitive and empathic rather than just blindly following our impulses. It's important to distinguish this from a sense of constant paranoia or guilt, as in the Judeo-Christian sense of it, which is a kind of feeling of always punishing myself. Now, the difference being with Hiriotopa, it's not that I'm a bad person, it's just that action was not worthy of me. Fundamentally, in my place of value, which I keep referring to, referring to every day, I look at in my life, think that action I did was not worthy of my true value. I, I have let myself down in that sense, but I can retract, I can set it right again. Yeah. And then we extend that sense of value to others. Like she also is someone to be valued. He also is something to be treated with respect. She also, her sensitivities, her pain concerns me. Therefore, I don't belittle them. I don't dismiss them. I don't look down upon them. I don't shut them out. I don't condemn them. I don't lie to them, cheat them, abuse them, use them for my own purposes. I respect them because to not do so would be damaging to my own heart, let alone to theirs. If my heart is acting in callous, insensitive, dismissive ways, what kind of heart is that? <laughs> yeah. You know, I have to live with that, right? So one guards one's heart. In guarding one's heart, one guards the welfare of others. In guarding the welfare of others, one guards oneself. In valuing the welfare of others, one values one's own heart. In valuing one's own heart truly, one values others because you touch others properly with your heart, not with your discriminating mind, not with your comparing, contrasting mind, but you're with your empathic and generous and sensitive heart. Hiriotopa keeps you in that place as you act in your day. Therefore, it is to be remembered and respected as something that we all have and should not dismiss casually brush off or diminish in any way. Thank you very much. Um, um, we've spent a little bit out of time, but I'm clear of where any of you can leave whenever you like. So if you got fed up with it, by all means, it's up to you whether you listen or not. But I feel I should try to put forth an effort to um, try to respond to your questions as fully as I can with my capacities. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much again, Beta, for holding this room available for us, for the world, for so many people. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Andalayam dhamitaya sadhu karangati damase Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu animadam Lampo, on behalf of everybody here and, and the whole community of Buddhist practitioners, uh, we know that we're, we're not there physically to invite you to enter the Vasa, um, but we wish you well sincerely from wherever that we are, that you, with the nourishment and the cultivation that you have in this practice, they add on another Vasa for 47 years and close to the decade. And um, uh, with that, you know, uh, we, we humbly seek for your forgiveness as well as your, your guidance to the rest of, of your life. 
um, faithfully um, and compassionately um, help us ease the suffering that we all face in this life. Sounds like a good project. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep working on it. We can only do this together. <laughs> Safe travels and uh, until you reach, um, um, you know, Chitabay Baker, please be well on for and we see you the next time. Okay, take good care, yeah? All right. You know, meditate, stay in the stream, stay in the stream. Okay. All right, three respects, everyone. First bow. Second bow. Thank you, Lampo. Take care.